Uh, Ms. Hartman. I would like to ask Mr. Buckley what he thinks the motives of the people who are in favor of the war in Vietnam are. Uh, putting it very simply, um, how can we possibly hope to help universal misery when we are so miserable here? Well, I think we're less miserable here. I mean, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm, you, you may not be a, a, a happy young lady, but I'm sure you're not as miserable as you would be if, for instance, mm, uh, you didn't have a free press, if you weren't able to write such poetry as you wanted to write, if you couldn't join a labor union, if you couldn't express yourself as you liked, uh, uh, if uh, uh, your, uh, the mayor of your town uh, might be uh, uh, disemboweled uh, tomorrow. I think that there are, there are observable differences Aren't you in favor of that? between the nature, between what freedom you have here, or, or put it this way, between your misery and theirs. If you, I wouldn't, prefer be, your uh, misery. If you wouldn't have saturation bombing take well, place I, in your I, just, I want to so. disagree with you for the moment, because I, I think that um, there is a certain condition, a human condition, the condition of guilt, which Mr. Chomsky speaks about, and which for me is the most interesting point of his argument, the guilt that we feel here, which in a w way may keep people from writing poetry or from writing anything that they think, because they're absolutely um, stifled they by the climate of guilt. They get on the best out of this. Excuse me? <laughs> they manage to write their complaints. <coughs> but I know of many people who are, not, who are not writing now because of the war in Vietnam, who are not functioning because of their guilt. Well, it's not, it's not, an, it's not an aspect of my responsibility for foreign policy to encourage you to externalize your complaints. But uh, if, if you want to, there, there are any number of book publishers, magazine publishers, and radio stations, television stations who are glad to hear them out, which I think is qualitatively different from what exists, for instance, in uh, North Vietnam. Or South. Or Greece. Well, or Greece, not for quite example, so much. or Brazil, a, a or dozens yeah. of other countries. Yeah. A little bit less so, yeah. sure. Less so? It, I think it's true. No, it's, it's not that, true. Then fact. publishing no, is the I'll only tell you what's motive. True. What's true is that a nation at war does not have the same amount of liberties as a nation at peace. Uh, Abraham Lincoln suspended the right to habeas corpus, yeah. uh, and the oldest parliament in the history of the world didn't have an election for 11 years during yes, the war. You know, war. if you compare the state of freedom in North and South Vietnam prior to the war, as some people have done, like Joseph Buttinger, I'm afraid it doesn't come out the way you like. Well, I think it does come out the way. Not by the evidence well, that's been as presented. As the refugees who, or number of the refugees who left North Vietnam, compare them with those who left South uh, Vietnam. That's, that's a very different issue. I, what, I say, if you, what I was talking about is the right of free expression in North and South Vietnam. I mean, take a look, for example, at Buttinger's analysis, you know, where he runs through cases. Uh, quite apart from that, uh, take a look at, for example, again, you know, pick your authority. I mean, let it be Bernard Fall, let it be almost anyone you like. See, there's a great amount of village democracy which was instituted in North Vietnam, and in fact has also been instituted in the NLF-dominated areas of South Vietnam, which is something qualitatively different than anything that has existed in Asian societies before. And this exists simultaneously with, let me be quite clear, this exists simultaneously with a good deal of repression and certainly not <coughs> civil liberties of the sort that we are used Chomsky, to. The most, the well, one of the most libertarian constitutions in the history of the world was written by the Soviet Union. I'm not talking about constitutions, I'm talking about My point is, what kind of freedom is experienced by somebody in North Vietnam? The answer is that the freedom is perpetually insecure. Oh, well, you don't for, know for that. For reasons, uh, well, you, you see, I know you that Ho Chi Minh himself has wept uh, but just, over, over the occasional but just necessity to kill 40,000, 50,000 of his own Not country. the necessity, the occasional fact. Uh, well, but just, but just, uh, just one moment, though, what I was talking, yeah. Uh, very, uh, not only sarcastic, but also wrong. And you see, it's very important to recognize, if you want to understand what communism means in Southeast Asia, to realize that along with many authoritarian and repressive practices, which I certainly don't condone, there is on the side a great deal of democratization. There's been a liberation of I energies and involvement. What a nonsense if I may say so. I don't think you're right. Uh, after all, the great, the, great, the great paradigm of Red China, in which the AFL-CIO itself concedes to uh, 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 to tw something in the neighborhood of 20 million victims on oh, that particular group. I'm talking, uh, according to them. Uh, well, perhaps, the AFL perhaps I didn't ask you whether that was the correct. The AFL-CIO. Uh, they did have a commission uh, out there. No this one has claimed the million people killed through, through Chinese communist purges. Oh. Absolutely no one. Well, no uh, one serious, at least. Quite a, it was published in the New Leader. Fine. Which well, the New Leader, yes, of course, the New Leader might. I mean, but I'm talking about no CIA one. plant. Uh, well, I said no one serious has. Take a look at the China <coughs> Journal. Well, I, take a look at China I, Quarterly. I consider this but you see, serious, uh, you see, I think you're missing the point, really, and I think it's an important point. See, I think in looking at China, one has to recognize a great deal of repressive practice, a great deal of authoritarianism. And one also has to recognize a great deal of, the, of spontaneous uh, democratic structure. 
of a sort which never existed in Asia before, and if you want to know the truth, to some extent doesn't even exist in our society. Now, these things exist side if, by if side. If you read A, a Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, you find out that there's an extraordinary democratic structure even inside concentration camps. But uh, no, it seems to me that, that it's, it's no, almost look, profane no, look, to make this observation. I think it's profane yeah. to make that analogy, because I'm talking about true democracy in I which... I so. uh, Look, in which people... Yeah. In which but, the, the people who... The peasants who live in a village but, control the institutions of their lives. They control the... Like, the if you want to get out, you bump into the Berlin Wall on either side of the... Uh, there's uh, no Berlin Wall in China. There is the equivalent of a Berlin Wall. There's the sea, and there's starvation, and there's concentration. No, there's no... Cancer. That's just the point. You see, starvation has been very largely overcome in China. Yeah, because, they, ha because they have something like 94% of people working on agriculture. But I think Mr. Doxey has a question <laughs> for you. They also haven't had two bumper crops in the last few years. Uh, Professor Chomsky, when you say, as you said about 30 minutes ago, that there was a relativity of truth between nations, would you classify... A relativity of truth? I don't know. Relativity of truth, you said, in the international scene. I don't understand the comment. If I said it, I don't know what it means. Well, would you call yourself a political... Uh -huh. <laughs> would you call yourself a political rel rel relativist? I, I don't understand the concept. Well, put it this way. Do you believe in a natural law, in uh, transcendental truth, let's say, a fixing social unit? I think that there's some there's something to the <coughs> doctrine of natural law, but I, I think that that's much more abstract than anything we've been discussing here. Well, but uh, wouldn't that then justify the use of terror in, um, let's say, stopping a, a tenet of the natural law from being broken, yeah. or stopping, let's say, the ends from... Uh, let's bring it down to earth. You know. I see, uh, I'm, of course, opposed to terror, any rational person is. But I think that if we're serious about the question of terror, if we're serious about the question of violence, we have to recognize that uh, that it is a tactical and hence moral matter. Incidentally, tactical issues are basically moral issues. They have to do with human consequences. And if we're interested in, let's say, diminishing the amount of violence in the world, it's at least arguable and perhaps even sometimes true that a terroristic act does diminish the amount of violence in the world. Hence, a person who is opposed to violence will not be opposed to that terroristic but act. Walt Ross is exactly the same thing. That's right. Yeah. Now, and he happens to be wrong in the case in which he applies it. No, you see, these principles tell you very little about real cases. No, but that's what's, yeah. that's, I must say, it's the one thing that bothers me more about what you've been saying than the way you write, mm. that, that that kind of language, that it is the notion of a terroristic act which restricts consequent violence, mm. is precisely what Rostow says in The View from the Seventh Floor, when after mm -hmm. this whole analysis about yeah. the moral world, he says yeah, there's I not think. a single place where we don't have major military might to but support look, it. I think that the, the real point here is that when you try to formulate general principles, principles that will apply to arbitrary political uh, affairs, you find very, that you can only make very vacuous and empty statements. See, if one wants to talk in perfect abstraction from any real situation about the justification for violence and terror, then you come up with platitudes and empty remarks and so on. The point is that, you know, there are no very general principles that apply to such circumstances, <coughs> or if there are, no one has enunciated and formulated them. So what one really has to do is look at the concrete historical situation. Now, where I would disagree, maybe Rostow and I would agree at this level of abstraction on, on uh, the use of violence to prevent less violent, more, uh, greater violence. Where we would disagree is in our evaluation of what is happening in this concrete historical situation. So therefore, and that's no, where one's attention ought to be. So, so, so therefore, you have no philosophical objection to the way in which Mr. Rostow states his case, merely to its applicability well, I have in existing circumstances. No, I, I say uh, at this level, I, wouldn't, I might mm -hmm. not. I don't know what he says but about he wouldn't that. Other things, but yeah. in other things, I have a very great di uh, difference. For example, Walt Rostow says that we should uh, try to strengthen, that the great threat of China to us is that it will succeed and provide a model to other countries. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. Is no, that why you kept it. him out of MIT? Uh, I, uh, I assure you that I had nothing to do with keeping him out of MIT. I'd be delighted to have him back. He's a great help to us when he's around. Thank you very much, Mr. Tomsky. Thank you all.